welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, before I introduce our presenter, I want to take a minute to say hello to any of our senior center participants who are watching today. I want to let you know that we are thinking of you, we miss you, and we're looking forward to the day that we can safely reopen the center. In the meantime, if, uh, if you or any Brookline senior, even if you're not one of our regular participants, uh, needs anything, even if you just want to reach out and say hello, uh, please know that you can reach us at the Senior Center. Our telephone number is 617-730-2770. You can leave us a message on the voicemail and we will get back to you. So please, please reach out, even if you just want to say hello. So today, I am pleased to be here with Joyce Graff. Joyce has been our quilting, uh, our Brookline Bees. It's, more, it's morphed into more now than a quilting group. It's a sewing group. Um, Joyce has been running it, I think maybe Joyce, what, for the last two years now? You've been there about two years? Yeah. 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 And, and she's done a wonderful job of bringing new folks into the group and introducing exciting projects that people have been working on. And, and while there's many things, because Joyce is very active in the community, there's many things that I could say to introduce Joyce. There's a couple of things recently that I just wanna bring up that she's done. Joyce was the first group leader at the Senior Center to get a Zoom group, an online group up and running um, when we closed uh, with the pandemic and very grateful for that. And she's also been making probably more masks than she can count at this <laughs> point for the community. She's donated a ton of them to the Senior Center, a ton of them to Got Masks Brookline. She's been doing online um, presentations on how to make masks. And so we are very grateful to Joyce for all that she's been doing for the community. Um, and today we're here for a nice, interesting, um, non-COVID related program on her uh, grandmother's quilts, which also get into a little bit of her um, study of genealogy. And she's done programs for us at the Senior Center in the past on that as well. So thank you for doing this today, Joyce, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Julie. I appreciate it. It's always delightful to be working with the good folks at the Senior Center. And I wanted to share a little background on why I have such a love of quilting and how much it is, um, it, it's part of my DNA, so to speak, because uh, the women in my family have been needlework artists for generations. And I, I finally got to see some of my grandmother's quilts. This is four generations of women. I'm the littlest one there, and I'm on the lap of my great-grandmother. That's me, my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother. And all of these women sewed, but my great-grandmother, Ella Mae Hinkle, was the most wonderful needlework artist for many generations. She's still the star um, that my sister and I look up to. So I wanted to share some of her work and some of the other women that I became aware of. This is her mother-in-law, um, Anna Eliza Ludwig. Her family was some of the founders of Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. And they had seven children these are the adult children here. Um, and one of them became the Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut. But this guy is my great grandfather. And uh, he was a lawyer, not a terribly successful lawyer, <laughs> but uh, and a, a high school pr principal for a while as well. Um, and he married um, my great grandmother, the woman you saw in the earlier slide. This is a carriage robe I'm gonna show you that was done by Anna Eliza Youngman in 1884. And it's in the collection of the Lycoming County Historical Society. So it's preserved there. And I made an appointment to go see it once. This is a carriage robe, which meant that when you were in a carriage with a horse, 
and it's an open carriage and it's winter, it gets kind of cold. <laughs> so, so you would have this blanket to put over your legs and keep you warm. The back side of it is velvet and the front side of it is satin. And this is a, a baby blocks pattern. People will recognize this. This pattern is being used today. But it, it also has embroidery. You can see the, the different designs and embroidery that are around it. This is all on satin with a velvet backing. And I'll show you a few details. In, in that day, the tradition was that every time you join two pieces of fabric, you put a, a different embroidery stitch so you can see all those little different embroidery stitches that she used. They, they all have a little twist to them. And um, they join these different pieces that are in the quilt. And then these pieces are embroidery. Here's another one. Beautiful pieces of embroidery. This is all done by hand. And in the center, she has her initials, Anna Eliza Youngman, with a little spider's web. This was a typical design at that time for needleworkers. And the pretty lettering that she did with some floral um, around it. And you can see all the different stitches just wandering around or making it different. But you had to get pretty creative to have a different stitch around each piece. Then this is my great grandmother. This is her as a young woman. Uh, her parents had 10 children. Uh, they died fairly early. And these were the youngest three girls. And according to their will, there was a house that was bought to house these three young women, uh, which was two doors from a church. And the, the house between them and the church was where the parson lived. So it was a proper place for three single ladies to be living. Um, and then she got married at 19 and lived in that house um, until her death in the 1950s. And I remember her. So you saw me sitting on her lap. Um, my sister and I were like four and five, I think, when she died. This is when she got married. This is my great-grandfather, the young man you saw with his parents before, and this is Ella May. And for her wedding, she made her own wedding dress. And my sister has the portrait. She was 19 years old, and uh, this was taken in her bedroom, which we remember. I, I stayed overnight once in her bedroom. And this was the handkerchief that she carried in her wedding. And I have this handkerchief. This is tatting, uh, and you use this, uh, uh, this uh, it's called uh, a shuttle. You use this shuttle to work a single piece of thread like, like you would sew with. It's not like crochet thread, it's finer than that. And you just take a single piece of thread, wind it around the shuttle, and then use that shuttle to work the thread. It's an amazing art. My sister does it, but I, I've never learned to do tatting. Joyce, when, how, long, how long do you think something like that would have taken them to make by hand? Oh, goodness. This is a, a large and uh, complicated piece, but she was truly a needlework artist. Don't know, but it, it would have probably taken uh, weeks. But... Um, she would have worked at it fairly intensely. You know, this was before television. So to entertain yourself in the evenings, that's what you did. Or you'd get a group of ladies together. Her bedroom had a big bay window. And so lots of light. And she used to set up a quilting frame in that bay window and invite some of the other ladies from the church to come join her. And they would do a quilting bee in the bay window in her bedroom. So... You had to worry about the light because you wouldn't want to do this with not enough light. Figure you're working by candlelight or uh, she did have gas in the house. She had gas lighting. As a matter of fact, when electricity came in, she wasn't sure that this newfangled stuff was going to succeed. So many of the fixtures in that house were partly gas and partly electricity. 
So if the electricity went out, you could always turn on the gas. So these are their three daughters. And this youngest one is my grandmother, Dorothy. And uh, Aunt Florence never married. She lived with her mother in that house until she died. And uh, we closed up the house. This is one of the quilts that she did. Uh, it was pieced by her and quilted by her in 1885. And my, um, my aunt, uh, my, sorry, my cousin Anne gave this to me after her mother passed away. She had the cat, this quilt and she said, oh, my daughters all have cats and the cats would destroy this quilt. So do you want it? I said, of course. So I tucked it away real fast before she changed her mind. When I got home, I looked at it and see, it looks like it has polka dots. Every one of those is actually a hole. And it, it, they were originally brown and the brown in that day had a lot of iron in it and the iron would rust right through the fabric. So in this quilt, every one of these little dots is actually a hole. And I, I took it down to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and talked with the textile people there. There's nothing to be done to repair it. Museums are not interested in it in this condition. So what we decided to do was to share it. And I'm the oldest of 21 cousins. So we wanted to share it amongst the 21 cousins. Whoops, I went a little too far. But there, this is the quilt before we actually cut it and we divided it into 24 pieces and gave everybody a frameable piece of her quilt because her hand quilting, you know, the stitching down through the quilt itself is really beautiful. And that way you can admire it and appreciate it. And people don't really um, want big pieces these days anyway. So we found people were very uh, glad to have a small piece. Um, this is, I call it Sarah's quilt. Her sister Sarah pieced this um, it, and she died earlier at the age of 27. So the, the quilt top was around and Ella May finished it in 1932. So quite a ways after that. But this is the quilt and it's in the collection of the Lycoming County Historical Society. That's my sister on the right and my mother on the left uh, holding the quilt. It really is a beautiful piece and the hand quilting, you can't see it terribly well, but she's quilted, it goes like this. Maybe you can see if I guide you a little bit. But that, that stitching, all done by hand, is really beautiful, very even, very pretty. And here's this quilted in 1932 by Mrs. James M. Youngman, pieced by her sister Sarah in 1870. And that's why labels are important, ladies. So if you make a quilt, be sure to put a label on it. This, uh, this piece I remember very well. She had an old upright piano and um, in Williamsport, there was frequently a flood. The river would flood and the waters would come up. And my, my great-grandmother had a, a system for lashing the piano to the banister so that it wouldn't float around and get totally ruined. Um, she, would, she would lash it to the banister and then go upstairs, move everything upstairs. And then as the waters receded, she would uh, take sweep the mud off the stairs and come on down and fix things up again. On the inside of her grandfather clock, she actually marked the high water mark for each of the floods. So it was quite a historical record. But I remember this scarf sitting on top of that, play, that upright piano. And because you couldn't see the top of it, the top of it is actually a pretty cheap muslin that has not weathered very well. But the part that hung down that you could see is velvet. And uh, at the end, she's made these fringes. Those fringes are about eight inches long. From here to here is about eight inches or a hand span. 
And that's macrame. Do you remember in the 1960s, macrame became very fashionable, but we did it with, with heavy twine. But this is done with sort of crochet cotton. It's actually fairly uh, fine work. And it was fashionable in the 19th century to do this kind of knotting. You just knotted it by hand to make these designs. And this is really a, a lovely piece. Here's a close up so you can see the work. So when we say the needlework artists, it was all this working with textiles that women did um, from a very young age. Usually by the time you were 12, you were expected to have done an embroidery sampler. Um, and certainly before you married, you were expected to have made a quilt. This counterpane she made for her wedding. This was part of her trousseau that she made when she was 19. It's satin and this is all handmade lace and hand embroidered. And um, my cousin Anne gave it to the Baltimore Museum of Fine Arts. So it's really a gorgeous piece. You can see the pillow shams again with the lace. I went to visit her one time and Anne put it on the bed for me. So I, of course, photographed it while I had the chance. Handmade lace that she's crocheted, and this is all embroidered. Beautiful embroidered flowers. And you can see different thicknesses of, of uh, thread to make it, it a little, give it some depth and some interest. And this is the dresser scarf, again, with handmade lace hanging down from it. So it was a real treat to me to sleep under this counterpane before it went to the museum. And this is a crazy quilt that she had started. And I'm going to show you more about this crazy quilt. But a crazy quilt is where you take just random patches of fabric that you have left over and you put them together in some, orga uh, some organization. And what she did was she took strips of sheeting. If you turn it over, you see this is old, what they call ticking, um, the kind of fabric, sturdy fabric that they use for sheets and pillowcases. Um, and this was a piece that was left over from some dress, maybe the rest of it wore out and she preserved this piece. There are a couple of pieces that have a shape that would tell you that it used to be a collar or something. So some of these pieces were already left over and then maybe she added this bit of embroidery. But again, every time you put in a new piece, you're supposed to make a different stitch to join those things. And here's a piece of embroidery similar to what she did for the counterpane. These are the ones that my sister has. My grandmother gave, gave her, when they closed up the house after my Aunt Flo died, um, there were these strips that she gave to Margaret and she said there's more around here somewhere I don't know but when I get it it should come to you because my sister is the wonderful needlework artist of our generation and uh, she gave her the materials too that her mother had used to make it these are cruel needles these are all from 19th century materials and the silks this is all silk. And here are some motifs that were embroidered. You bought these and then stitched them on. And her sketches for these, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of faint, but she did pencil sketches. That's why it's faint. Um, it, it hasn't all weathered terribly well. But she was working on this um, off and on until she passed away in the 1950s. So this is all pretty old stuff. So she said, well, there's more stitches or more panels around here somewhere, but we'll find them eventually. Well, we never did find them. And so my, my sister has these three stitches and the materials and would love to finish this quilt. And when we went 
to the Lycoming County Historical Society and we made an appointment to see the, the two quilts we knew about that they had. They said, oh, we have two quilts and three strips. And my sister said, if those are those strips, I'm just going to die. So we looked and these are the three strips that are in the Lycoming County Historical Society that were intended to go with this quilt. And it's a long saga, but um, one of my grandmother's sisters had taken most of her quilts with her and evidently collected these three strips as well. These are the three that were the most complete. The ones Margaret has are less complete, but you can see this one looks like a collar. It's an old collar from something. This piece obviously was left over from something. But beautiful pieces of embroidery, this is one way to collect them. Or my grandmother would say, oh, I remember that dress. So the Lycoming County Historical Society will not release the three strips to my sister, and she is not going to donate hers to them. So we thought we would just bring it together with Photoshop. So this is what it might have looked like, um, edged with a little black velvet. And uh, it's fun to think of it all together. So I hope you've enjoyed the tour of my grandmother's quilts. So, so I have kind of a strange question around the qu crazy quilt versus the, the um, bedding that was part of the trousseau. When you look at art today, different forms of art are perceived differently within the art community, right? Street art, public art is, has kind of a different connotation to it than other kinds that something that hangs on a wall in a museum. With the crazy quilts, was that, to me that feels like a kind of a comfortable form of a quilt, right? It's made with yeah. things you have around the house, things that are meaningful to you, the collars, those kinds of things. Were those perceived differently when they were created? <laughs> Does that make sense, what I'm asking you? Were they seen as kind of a lesser form or a less skillful form of quilting than other kinds of things that were created? I see what you're saying. No, yeah. I think that actually because of the embroidery stitches, the, yeah. the embroidery stitches, it was a big challenge. Yeah. And um, I think most modern people don't really appreciate them so much because they do look like just a bunch of leftovers. But uh, in fact, it was quite an art to put it together and to do all that embroidery. So it's, it was a huge undertaking. Right, I mean, that's my perception of it. It seems like it was quite skillful to be able to put that all together and make it a whole, so. Right, right, right. And isn't it wonderful that you have all of that material, that you have the actual objects and that some of them are in museums, and that you have all those wonderful family photos too. It's well, really you remember I said I'm the oldest of 21 grandchildren. So it was very clear to me long time ago that I would never have these pieces themselves, besides which you have to take care of them or they just rot, you know? So it needs to be in climate controlled and acid free boxes and every piece of paper or anything that you put next to it has to be very carefully chosen because otherwise it can contribute to the deterioration of the piece. So I decided a long time ago that I would be very happy with the photographs. Yeah. And so my collection of photographs has turned out to be a wonderful asset. And I've, I've done this presentation for my cousins as well, because most of them have never even seen them. I'm the oldest, so I was there and I remember my great grandmother and I've, I've seen these pieces myself, but most of the younger ones don't have those memories. So having the photographs and being able to share them has really been wonderful. Absolutely. What a lovely legacy, you know, to be able to share with others. Well, thank you for sharing this with us today. And I hope, I know we've discussed the possibility that maybe you'll do some online easy travels for us too in the days right. ahead. So okay. stay tuned, everyone. We'll see if we can get Joyce back to do some of her easy travel talks, which are equally as interesting. So thank you very much for doing this, Joyce. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care.